let's talk about the ozone layer. <laughs> You've heard about the ozone layer, these molecules in the upper atmosphere that protect us from the UV rays that come from the sun. If you grew up in the 70s or 80s like I did, you probably heard a lot about the ozone layer because we were very worried about this hole in the ozone layer. You can see it in that photo there, that purple splotch over the South Pole. And our parents were always telling us, put on your sunscreen, you're gonna get skin cancer, there's a hole in the ozone, right? We were very worried about this. Now, why was there a hole in the ozone? Well, that was a topic of great debate initially when it was discovered that there was a hole in the ozone layer. And eventually we discovered that the reason for the hole in the ozone was us, uh, specifically us using things like hairspray, we used a lot of hairspray in the 80s. Um, and it has, it has these chemicals in it called chlorofluorocarbons. And chlorofluorocarbons damaged our ozone layer. Now, I'm not actually here to make you feel bad or guilty about using hairspray. In fact, um, there's great news. I have good news for you today. The hole in the ozone, it's not a thing anymore. Did you guys know that? Some people don't even know this, but we actually fixed the hole in the ozone. This is a very inspiring story. I know, isn't that great? Yay! No more hole in the ozone. So how did we fix the hole in the ozone layer? Well, it's, it's a combination of things. One was that there was some very good science that was done. There was a couple of scientists that hypothesized that chlorofluorocarbons were involved in causing this hole in the ozone layer. But their experiments were done exclusively in a lab environment, and people didn't really believe it. And it wasn't until this woman, Susan Solomon, who's one of my personal heroes, uh, went to the Antarctic in the dead of winter. You can imagine what that would be like to go to the Antarctic in the dead of winter. It's very, very cold. Um, she made measurements of levels of gas molecules in the atmosphere. It was so cold that sometimes her eyelid would freeze shut while she was trying to look into her instruments. And she was the one that collected the incontrovertible data that demonstrated that, yes, indeed, humans were producing chlorofluorocarbons, which we knew, but those chlorofluorocarbons were getting into the atmosphere and causing ozone depletion. Then the other thing that happened that was pretty amazing was that in 1987, which was only about five years later, policymakers came together in Montreal, Canada, from all around the world, representing all the major developed countries, and they signed an agreement to phase out the production of chlorofluorocarbons. And this was called the Montreal Protocol. And if you look at the graph of production of chlorofluorocarbons, it was going up. We were making fluorocarbon, chlor chlorofluorocarbons, other countries were as well. It was going up, and then in 1987, when the Montreal Protocol was signed, it started going down. And in fact, now we don't make chlorofluorocarbons at all in the US, and most places do not. So that's how we were able to fix this problem that was a problem of global proportions. Now, you're probably thinking that this story bears certain parallels to issues that we face today a crisis of global proportions that could impact the well-being of life on the planet. And in order to solve it, we would have to all come together and have some sort of agreement that would require change for the better. It's a time when it's hard to imagine that happening. Scientists aren't the only ones who feel this, but certainly scientists are feeling a polarization. They're feeling a resistance to acceptance of scientific research. Scientists are marching. They want to hold up the facts and say, listen to us people, there's important things for you to be thinking about. <laughs> Thank you for being a science-friendly audience. Um, that's awesome. Um, but we also recognize that that's not always the case. And the, the, there's, there's, it feels like there's a divide that's really hard to bridge right now. People feel very entrenched in their viewpoints. There's a lot of tribalism. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot as a scientist. What is my role in society to not just do science, but to communicate the results to people who may or may not actually be involved in the scientific process? And for help in answering that question, I've turned to a great hero to scientists, this man right here. <laughs> You might recognize him as Hawkeye Pierce in MASH. This is Alan Alda. And Alan Alda, over the past couple decades, has been a wonderful advocate of science. He has founded the Stony Brook Institute for Communicating Science, and he brings scientists to learn about how to connect with audiences and how to share their scientific results in a way that's accessible. 
I had a really wonderful opportunity a few months back to get to spend a whole day with Alan Alda. <laughs> this is like the best day of my life. Um, he's really as wonderful as you might think he would be in person, even better. Uh, we had a wonderful time together. But I was bringing him to the campus at UNC Greensboro with the hopes that he would sort of tell us, like, okay, what do we do? Like, tell me the three things, Alan. What are the three things that we have to do to help bridge this gap between scientists and non-scientists? And Alan sort of laughed at that. And he said, you know, Nadja, what if I said to you, tell me the three things I need to know to be a great chemist. And I'll just then go be a chemist. It's not that simple, like tips and tricks are good, but there's a need to live this stuff. And when the question is how do we connect with other people, it's not something that you can just do with some, some data sheets and some facts, and it's not something that you can just do knowing a few tips, it's really about how do you reach out to another person in a way that allows you to come to some common ground, and that's something you really have to practice a lot. So what I'd like to do now with all of you is to talk a little bit about the story of my science, because as Alan says, stories are extremely important when it comes to communicating these tough scientific topics. I want to tell you a little of the story of my science, and it'll all come back. So you were probably taught about science, if you were in elementary school or middle school, you were probably taught about the all-important scientific method. This is how scientists teach about science. It's very sterile. It's the all-important hypothesis. You must have a hypothesis. And then you conduct experiments in the lab. They're very carefully conducted experiments. You have your safety glasses. You're pouring things back and forth in the beakers. Things are bubbling up. You have your lab coat on. Maybe some things explode. It's very exciting. But only a select few are involved. And then you have your results. And somehow you interpret those results to come up with maybe some new questions. And then you go back to the hypothesis and you just keep going around and around and around. And the part that we leave out when we teach science this way, which tends to be the way we teach science, is the people that are involved in every step of this process. The people come up with hypotheses, the people come up with questions, and in most importantly, the people are involved in interpreting what the results mean for all the rest of us. I want to give a shout out to some of the people that are involved in my learning science. This is John Salinas. Hi, John. John was a chemistry professor at Rogue Community College, where I got my start. And John taught me a lot about science. He introduced me to scientific instrumentation when I was just a kid and let me play with it. Uh, I also worked with Ed Espinoza in university and with Chris Enke, who is my mentor for my PhD in chemistry. And I was so grateful to have these wonderful mentors. And that's really the way the scientific process works. It's all about learning from other people and standing on the shoulders of giants. And now I'm fortunate enough to work with an amazing team of scientists. This is a picture of them. These are all students that work in my research lab. They're incredible. And everything that we do, all of the ideas we come up with, all of the creativity, all of the innovation is because of them. And it's because of what they bring to the table. We like to talk about and think about science as very objective. I think part of the reason we do that is we're afraid people won't trust us if we admit that people are involved in this process. But the reality is that what we do and, and where we go with our science is totally shaped by our human experience. And this is very much the case for me. So the, the question that we're interested in addressing with our scientific research is this question of drug-resistant bacterial infections and how we can come up with ways to cure them. Drug-resistant bacterial infections are a huge problem. The, many of you have probably heard of MRSA infections. Many of you may have had a MRSA infection or known someone who's had one. These infections are acquired in hospitals, sometimes in community settings. They can be deadly. It's a real problem when you have someone going in the hospital to get better and they end up acquiring a deadly infection. We don't want that to happen. Um, so we're interested in finding new ways to treat these infections. And we do that by going, strangely enough, into the natural world. We look at plants and fungi and bacteria and the molecules that they produce, and those are the inspiration for the development of the next generation of drugs. Now, why is it that I go into the woods to look for new molecules? It's a very, may seem like an unobvious choice, 
About 70% of the anti-infective treatments that we currently have, the ones that you use today, antibiotics like erythromycin, they come from bacteria or fungi already. So there's a great precedent for doing this. But that great precedent, the statistics in the literature, is not what made me want to go into nature to look for new molecules. I actually like going into nature because I was raised by hippies. That's my family right there. Uh, in, in, about, in the early 1980s, my parents decided that they were going to go off the grid. You know, I'm sure many of you have thought of doing this, like let's just throw the iPhone away and go live off the land. They actually did that. There were no iPhones. But they went and lived off the land. And it was a really unusual and amazing way to grow up, to be able to grow up with them in rural Oregon. They were very, very resourceful people. My dad, you know, we didn't have a flush toilet, we didn't have electricity, we lived in a yurt for a long time, 300 square feet with a family of five. Um, when we didn't have a flush toilet, my dad built us an outhouse. It was a two-seater outhouse. It was very chic. There was no wall in between. It was, it was, we were the hippies. It was all good. Um, my mom sewed the dress that I'm wearing in that photo. She's awesome. She made clothes for us. She made me a grass skirt to wear to prom. No, I'm making that part up. That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> I didn't go to prom. I was homeschooled. <laughs> so in thinking about this research area that we're interested in, which is going to nature and finding molecules to treat disease, we're inspired by stories like the story of Sir Alexander Fleming. He invented penicillin. He says he actually didn't. He says nature did it, and he just discovered it by accident. So this is an example of science happening in a way that's not at all the way we describe it as this hypothesis-driven process where we know exactly what we're going to get when we walk into the lab. Sir Alexander Fleming had a series of petri dishes in his lab that had bacteria growing on them, and he went on vacation. And while he was on vacation, some mold started growing on his petri dishes. Now when he came back, he saw the mold growing on his petri dishes, and rather than throwing them out and saying, oh, well, that was a contaminated experiment, let's start over. He was a curious scientist. He looked closely at the Petri dishes and he said to himself, hmm, it looks like the bacteria don't really grow very well in the areas where mold is growing. What's going on there? Maybe the mold is making a molecule that actually inhibits the growth of the bacteria. And that question, that thought, led eventually to the development of penicillin G, which revolutionized medicine. It totally changed the way that we treat sicknesses, and it made it so that situations where someone might just get a minor scratch and end up dying from an infection could be cured. Now, we would love, in my research group, to discover the next penicillin. This is actually a photograph of some of the samples that we work with in our research. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> These are fungi, like the fungus that makes penicillin. We have a library of a thousand of these that are in suspended animation in test tubes. And they grow, and when they grow, they make these different beautiful colors. And those colors are indicative of different molecules they're producing. And perhaps one of those molecules is the next penicillin. That keeps us going. It's really exciting. But it's also frustrating because there's a problem with the use of antibiotics for treating infection. And probably many of you have heard of this. And that problem is the development of resistance. So even as soon as a new antibiotic hits the, the, hits the medical community and we are able to give it out to the public, we have situations where resistance develops. And resistance is essentially the, the bacteria morphing and changing in response to us trying to kill them and becoming even more powerful. So what you end up with is first you sort of have an army of regular bacteria, and then you end up with an army of supervillain bacteria. And it's even harder to fight. And MRSA is an example of that. MRSA stands for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It didn't exist until we started using methicillin to treat infections. So we made it. We made this thing. And we're in an arms race with the bacteria. Every time we come up with a new antibiotic, the bacteria become resistant, and then we're sort of back to square one. So scientists like myself have been thinking about, is there a way to break the cycle of resistance, to break out of that constant arms race with the bacteria? And one of the things 
we've been doing actually is studying how bacteria communicate with each other. So in the same way that Alan Alda has been studying how the scientists communicate, the scientists have been studying how the bacteria communicate. You might sort of think of this as a diplomatic approach as opposed to the finding a big weapon to wipe out the bacteria. What if we could start to understand how bacteria work? So it turns out the bacteria communicate by producing various molecules. And those molecules send each other signals. They might say things like, hi, or go away, or attack, OK? So <laughs> actually understanding how bacteria communicate is giving us new insights into how we might find alternative strategies for dealing with bacterial infections. And one of these insights comes in realization of the importance of the microbiome. So the microbiome is bacteria that live all over our skin and the surfaces of our body. And you've probably heard of the microbiome. It's actually very important in digesting our food, but it's also important in protecting us from infections. The healthy bacteria on your skin send out signals that prevent you from being colonized by pathogens like MRSA. So this realization led us to ask the question, what if bacteria could, we could actually use bacteria themselves to treat infections? What if you had a patient with an infection and you put some good bacteria on their skin and could actually fight off the bad bacteria? And that actually seems to be working. In fact, it's a little ironic, but the most successful thing that's come out of my research that's actually being used in patients right now in clinical studies um, through collaborations with other scientists in San Diego is the use of beneficial bacteria as a way to handle rashes and infections. So it's a little bit meta. This concept that we're talking about of trying to communicate with other people, what Alan Alda says is that it comes down to seeing others not as your enemies, but as your allies, to talking to other people in a way that allows you to be willing to be changed by what you hear, by what the other person is saying. And that's exactly what we're doing with bacteria. We see them not as our enemies, as our allies, and that allows us to do something different. So going back, going back to the hippies for a second, I, I am often asked, when did you become a scientist? And I used to always think, well, shoot, was it, was it some particular teacher that made me want to become a scientist? Why did I decide to become a scientist? And it turns out that the answer to this question is, I was always a scientist. I was always curious. I was always asking questions. And I was born with an interest in the natural world. And that was fostered by the wonderful opportunity I had of growing up close to nature. All of you were born curious, too. You are all also scientists. And for me, I was lucky enough not to have anyone tell me that I couldn't be a scientist. And so I'm telling all of you in the room today <laughs> that you can be scientists too. Because, and you are, you are all scientists. The process of scientific discovery involves people and that needs to involve all people. If we're looking at how to address the problems that the human race faces in the future, which are pretty significant, the times they are changing, right? If we're looking at how to address those problems, it's going to take all of us to come up with creative solutions. So it's on all of us. But I don't want that to seem like a heavy weight on our shoulders, because we can do incredibly creative things together. And if Alan Alda's right, which I think he is, the first step in that process is a very simple one. It's just engaging in a conversation with another human being, maybe somebody who doesn't agree with you, and being willing to learn from that individual and come away changed. Let's all do that.